they shown that if you put this mesenchymal stem cells on a material and then you control the stiffness of the material you can control what the cell will be so if i put the cells on a very soft material that is like our brain which is the one of the softest tissue in our body these cells become neuron if you put them on a material which is stiff which like bone the cells become bone and if you give them a material which the stiffness matching the stiffness of your muscle which is a intermediate then the cells become muscle so it was found that you can actually control their fate and when you are controlling this fate meaning you are controlling the epigenetics so you can control the epigenetics by using mechanics so this is one example of Hey hi welcome to Biotech Talks in this episode we have Dr Abhijit Majumdar from IIT Bombay now his lab is known as M lab which focuses on how the mechanical aspect of a tissue influences or controls the cellular behavior or the fate of the cell mechanical forces controlling the cellular behavior i mean if you are growing some cells on a petri dish then the surface of that petri dish whether it is hard or soft that is going to decide the cellular fate and cellular behavior now this information has amazed me and i'm sure that you will be amazed as well hello sir how are you good how are you i'm also doing good sir so starting with the first question what is mechanobiology okay so to answer that question i mean uh, just for your non bio background audience i will just go back a little you know a step back so in our body we have like you know trillions of cells right and if you think of that all of this these cells they are working in synchrony and to be healthy to 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 do everything properly all of these cells they need to kind of communicate to each other the control over a single cell or a single unit a single human being is easy but when you need to control so many people you need to have a very strong uh, method to communicate now for a long time we believe that 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 communication happens via chemical signaling and which is true then we also kind of realize that electrical signaling play an important role as well so this mechanobiology or the mechano signaling is the new kid in the block that now we have started to realize that the mechanical signal that is the uh, stiffness rigidity force applied by a cell fluid flow and the force applied by a fluid when it flows over a surface all of these mechanical signals can influence cellular behavior can control cell fate and their function and also help for two cells to communicate with each other so the understanding of this method of uh, controlling cellular behavior which we call as uh, mechano signaling so that subject is called the mechanobiology i was just making an analogy mm-hmm. between the chemical signaling and this mechanical signaling mm-hmm. and i had one question that what are the receptors in this mechanical signaling like chemical signaling have yes so that's a very good question and that is actually a question for like you know open research in some sense because also uh, we kind of intuitively knew that okay mechanical signal plays a role but that got into the real attention only in last 20 years whereas we are studying you know chemical signals for many many years so our understanding of mechano signals is limited compared to the way we understand the chemical signals right so how the cell can understand or decipher a mechanical signal so to understand that first we need to go again a uh, one step back that when we apply force what happens when we apply force two kind of things may happen that a uh, thing that is the state of motion may change as we all know that it go from the rest to motion or the motion to rest the other thing that can happen is the deformation mm-hmm. right 
So, in case of a cellular context, in this mechanobiology context, when the force is applied from externally, the deformation may happen and that deformation can happen at various stages. Okay? The deformation may happen at a cell membrane mm. and then the membrane can deform causing maybe some uh, ion channel that is, you know, that the pores that we have at the uh, membrane that to open. What may happen is that the protein which are at the cell surface to change their configuration as you may know cells adhere to their surroundings using the protein called integrin. So when this force is applied these integrins can come together and then they form something you know we call as integrin cluster. So the integrin clustering happens and then if you think of the protein as a spring so when the force is applied that the protein actually opens okay. that is the unfolding of protein that we call and because of that unfolding it can now recruit newer you know it can uh, shake hand with newer partners and the overall a chain of you know cascade of signaling can happen inside the cell. So it is again the unfolding of the protein but now unfolding is happening via a force. Okay. So that is at one level. Then if I look at inside the cell, also uh, say nuclear, because we know all the control happens inside the nucleus or the majority of the control, right? And for that lot of the proteins need to pass and go inside the nucleus, passing the nuclear membrane and also come out. Again, that control can happen via applying force because again, you can open the nuclear membrane pore allowing now the larger molecule to go or you can close it allowing things not to pass okay that is one level then there are further levels that is again you are a student of biology that the gene so like the you know the the up regulation or down regulation of gene is controlled by by the ease of uh, you know accessibility yeah. whether that gene is easily accessible or not and that accessibility we know is controlled by say acetylation, methylation, etc. So essentially our gene is a long thread that is wrapped around and if it is wrapped around tightly, it is difficult to access. If it is wrapped a little loose, it is easy to access. Now again, so far we thought that this tightening or loosening can happen by adding some chemical molecule or taking away some chemical molecule. But now we are rea realizing you can just apply force like a thread and you can make it more tightly packed or less tightly packed. So these are all the various levels of or the methods the way this mechano signaling play a role. Uh, one more thing that is genetics involved in controlling this mechanical forces in, in, in the cells. Okay. So the uh, I would say rather epigenetics. Okay. Right. So, for example, if I give you one example, uh, I think in 2006 that paper came and you know that that was a seminal paper in this field. So, they have used mesenchymal stem cells. Hmm. So, this, these stem cells are adult stem cells coming from our bone or bone marrow. Now, these cells we knew already by that time that if I give the chemical signal, certain kind, you know, kind of chemical signal, they can become bone they can become fat, they mm -hmm. can become muscle, they can become cartilage and also they can become neuron, mm -hmm. right. All these possibilities are there but all the control of you know changing that is called the differentiation or lineage specification that used to happen using chemical signals. So, so that we knew. What in the 2006 paper they have shown they shown that if you put these mesenchymal stem cells on a material and then you control the stiffness of the material, hmm. you can control what the cell will be. So if I put the cells on a very soft material that is like our brain, which is the one of the softest tissue in our body, these cells become neuron. Okay. If you put them on a material which is stiff, which like bone, the cells become bone. And if you give them a material which the stiffness matching the stiffness of your muscle, 
which is an intermediate, then the cells become muscle. So it was found that you can actually control their fate and when you are controlling this fate, meaning you are controlling the epigenetics. So you can control the epigenetics by using mechanics. So this is one example of mechanics. And this is very surprising because in a conversation with Deepa Subramanyam mm -hmm. from NCCS, yes. she is studying stem cells yeah. and the movement of molecules that is happening within yeah. stem cells, whether they are responsible for differentiation or not. Right. And that and this. That so they, Deepa is also uh, looking into some aspect of mechanobiology. Okay. I mean her lab, it is not that her, the central focus of her lab is mechanobiology, but she is also looking into mechanobiology, the role of mechanobiology in stem cell differentiation in some aspect. And actually this is very surprising for a biology student because mm -hmm. uh, the way we think is there is DNA, Yes. they code some proteins, those chemicals then are responsible for the fate of the cell. Exactly. And now that you said that the surface exactly. controls the yes. fate of the cell, that is very surprising to listen. Not just the surface, I mean there are like the, actually this field is that's why very interesting, intriguing. And this is a developing field because if you kind of look at that, you know, in the recent, so like the last year or last, last year, many of the major journals, they actually came up their dedicated issue for this. It is a kind of an emerging field. Right? So as, as, as I was telling you, it is not just the stiffness, that is only one aspect, right? Then in another paper, it is 2004 or 2006, again with the mesenchymal stem cells, what they have shown that if you put the cells on some kind of island, okay, you create island mm -hmm. and you put, the, so the island of protein mm -hmm. and then you put the cells there mm -hmm. so that the cell will take the shape of that island, okay, small micro island they created. And what they have shown that if you create a micro, micro island shape of a star, okay, which are very sharp corners. It is also a pentagon but with the sharp corners. The mesenchymal stem cell become osteogenic, bone-like. On the other hand, if you give them of the island of same area, pentagon, again a pentagon but flower, so that it is not yeah. a sharp corner, it is a rounded corner. Then the same, same mesenchymal stem cell, they become fat-like, that is adipogenic. So you can control by, they are, they are morphology, they are fate by controlling their morphology. Then uh, not just the mesenchymal stem cells, uh, people have shown that the neuronal differentiation that can be controlled if you can you know give them this kind of long track and as you know the neuronal cells they prefer to be long and the track like like. So if you if you provide them long track then they actually get aligned along the long track and then they try to become neuronal. If you put the cells and if you give them a motion, a periodic motion that is stretching and so the stretch and compression, stretch and compression. So you give them a periodic motion and they become heart radiomyocyte. So it is very interesting that how the form and function, they are kind of you know, intertwined, that you make them do what they are supposed to do and then they become that. So, are we building any artificial organs? So, like so in uh, various different places, people are also, you know, using these aspects to make the artificial organs. Uh, and also, this kind of brings to the other point is that uh, if you want to make artificial organs, it is very important to bring these mechanical features mm. into picture. So people are doing that. So they are working on that area and the, the work is in progress. Yes. So what research is going on in your lab? Okay. So my lab as we call our lab as AIM lab and AIM stand for, for, uh, stand for mechanics, material, microfluidics, right? So these are the various different things we look at. So I was talking to you about the mechanics and the materials. So we look into how these mechanical signals are involved in stem cell as I discussed about. Also 
other you know in a diseased situation for example cancer so just to give you one example so this work is done with uh, 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 dr shilpi dat from actric so it is a collaborative work so here we are looking into the glioblastoma which is a brain cancer and it is one of the uh, deadliest cancer because the prognosis is very poor okay if today someone is detected with you know the glioblastoma even after doing chemotherapy radiotherapy surgical removal all of these life span is 12 to 18 months okay it is not beyond that that even after removal of everything cancer comes back so initial tumor if we call that initial tumor as a parent tumor even after removal radiotherapy everything the tumor comes back which we call as the relapsed tumor and once the relapsed tumor comes back you cannot do much okay and very kind of uh, depressing in some sense that if we look at that the five years survival rate what was there in 1960 and what is now it has not moved much maybe a little few months here and there but we really but for many other cancers we have done a mm -hmm. huge progress right so as i was telling you that the it is clinically known that the parent tumor and then the relapsed tumor, so if I compare, the relapsed tumor is much more aggressive. Mm. Once it comes back, it is like very aggressive, spreads very quickly, tumor grows, it is uh, resistant to the drug and all of such thing happens. Now in Shilpi's lab, they had a model of parent tumor and the relapsed tumor, also uh, a patient sample, cell line, etc. But when you are culturing those cells on the plastic petri plates, what is done everywhere, you don't see much difference in their behavior. That you don't see that your relapsed tumor cells are more aggressive. And until and unless you can recapitulate the phenotype in the lab, you cannot do research further, right? So what then we asked the question that the plastic petri plates are way stiffer than our brain. What if the difference is actually become prominent in that atmosphere? Mm. So we provided the cells, both parent and the relapsed, soft brain-like substrate. Mm. And back. The, now the, the relapsed tumor are much more migratory, much more invasive, growing must much faster than the parent tumor, uh, resistant to the drug and when you take these cells, that is uh, cells grown on plastic and cells grown on this plastic, uh, this soft gel and you put them back in mouse brain, you see that these cells which are grown on soft brain like stiffness, they are much more aggressive and that aggression, so now if you think of I have parent and relapse and I have stiff and soft. So when I look at stiff, parent and relapse, they are very similar. Mm. When I, as soon as I, you know, go on soft, parents also become aggressive, but relapse become much more aggressive. Now, then we looked at, okay, now I have an aggressive phenotype. Now let me check, do a RNA-seq that what has going up, what is going down. So after doing that, we have, understood we have identified one particular protein plecha 7 which gets upregulated in the relapsed tumor only when they are grown on soft gel then we have used uh, you know to bring the down which is called the, you know, the knocking down the plecha 7 and then we see that the many of these aggressive phenotypes become you know comes down so that kind of tells us so i am nowhere claiming that we have found a cure for Glioblastoma, right? I am nowhere claiming that. But what I am saying is that this research gives us a handle and to find the newer targets mm. which were so far hidden because we were culturing the cells on a material which was non physiological. Mm. So, this is the kind of research that we are trying to do in our, do in our lab. You also work on organ on chip concept. Correct. So, what is that? So, organ on chip is, so it is not artificial organ, okay. okay. 
that is if i today if i talk that i'm working on say heart on chip I don't mean that I am creating an artificial heart that can be implanted. Okay. But what these are used is that, again, if I just try to connect, that you, just the example that, that I told you, you saw that uh, if I need to do a drug testing, hmm. suppose, I, if I do just them, just if I put the cells just on plastic petri dish and do the drug testing, whatever result I get, that may not match when I will be actually using it in the animal mm. or patient, right? And as a result, in today's in drug drug industry, we start with 5,000 to 10,000 molecules, the potential molecules to treat a disease. Many of them shows the, you know, shows the positive result in the cell culture step, in vitro as we call it. But as soon as, soon as we go to the mouse, many of them fail and then when you go to the uh, human again many of them fail so we start with 5000 to 10000 molecules we end up getting only one drug which pass all the trial so that's why in today's system getting a single drug is takes 9 to 10 years minimum kind of time and a huge investment and so what if we can predict better what if we can culture the cells initial testing and we can do a better prediction that what is going to happen so there comes our this organ on chip idea that we try to mimic the organ in a small scale you know a very micron scale kind of structure which can be used for drug testing can be toxic, uh, toxicity testing maybe some kind of basic biology kind of question so Basically, meaning of the organ on chip is that you are trying to uh, mimic at least minimum one cell type that is present in that organ. Mm. Generally, it is the multiple cell types that we use. At least one functional behavior. Mm. Say, if I want to today do the, say the lung on chip, then it should have a membrane, which is kind of, you know, allowing things to diffuse through so mm. one functional one cellular as i said it at least should have one epithelial lung epithelial cell it can be a membrane one side lung epithelial cell other side uh, endothelial cells so that is the structure one functional so it should have a membrane for the for the exchange of say gas or liquid then you can also give it a system so that it expands and you know give the cyclic motion again to mimic lung so one structural one functional one cellular at least this much it should mimic then you can call it okay this is an organ on chip and this can be used as i said for drug testing and other purposes so are there any examples that your lab has developed okay so we are working on uh, at present three different uh, organ on chip models all are in collaboration uh, two are with the collaboration with uh, dr projecta dandekar in ict mumbai and there we are trying to develop skin on chip and uh, retina on chip okay. model so and with dr deepak modi at nirrh and uh, dr devjani paul in bioscience department so with, uh, with with them we are trying to develop a placenta on chip okay. so they are again we are trying to understand that so you know that the placenta works as a barrier right that kind of protect the growing embryo and uh, so the drug that the mothers take or or the or lot of the other things that the mother takes for many of the things you don't want those things to pass the placental barrier and go to the embryo mm. You don't want that but if there is a defect in embryo or something and you are using a drug you want that drug to pass that barrier and go there right so we are trying to develop a placental model organ on chip model to study this barrier function okay. so thank you very much sir for your thank time. you it was really nice talking to you yeah.